typically a haunting can be placed in one of three categories. The first category is demonic or poltergeist. These hauntings usually involve entities that were not ever human and wish to cause harm. The next category is a residual haunting. This is the most common haunting that people will experience. This haunting involves a trauma. A residual haunting is like a stamp in time. For example, if somebody dies in a sudden or tragic death, it's almost like the energy of their being was placed in this moment in time and it, and it goes on repeat, almost like a scratched record or a scratched CD. In fact, many paranormal investigators believe that with the residual haunting, the spirit of the person or the soul of the person is not actually in the haunting. Again, it's just like the outline of their being was stamped in time because of the impact of the trauma. For example, over our history, many hauntings involve people who have fallen out of a window to their death. Some of these hauntings, people will see the people who died still standing by the window. Paranormal investigators believe that that doesn't mean the person's soul is there. It's just an imprint, a photograph of what happened right before they died. And that energy is still what is present, not necessarily the person. However, our third category of hauntings is what is called an intelligent haunting. This is when the spirit of the person is able to interact with the people who are still alive. It's when the spirit is able to come through the veil and communicate. These intelligent hauntings are aware that they are no longer in a living body. They're usually able to tell people still alive how they died or who they are or were in life. In my opinion, this is definitely the case of Annie Laurie. Now you got to know Annie Laurie and the Hoyt family, Beth Hoyt, in part one. Well, now in part two, you're going to get to meet Beth's daughter, Keely. Keely and I are the same age. And Keely has some very, very profound evidence of Annie Laurie's existence. Now, again, this is part two of Annie Laurie's story. So if you have not seen part one yet, I do recommend that you watch that first. Part one will be linked below. Now this part two is also not the end of Annie Laurie's story. I ha still have a lot more interviews that I would like to do over people's experience with her. So if you're not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you can be notified when we upload more videos about Annie Laurie or any other story on this channel. I will also place links to Keely and Keely's business down below in the description box. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're gonna to be talking about Annie Laurie and the letter. daughter. I am here to talk about the um, Hoyt house and the hauntings that went on in the house. I am Eleanor Hoyt's granddaughter, um, so I am fifth generation um, in, the, in the family and I have lots of cool stories to tell. So in part one, your mother spoke about Annie Laurie, the ghost in your grandparents' house, in the history of the house. Um, when did you first learn of Annie Laurie? I was probably around eight or nine years old when I first started started really becoming interested. I might have heard about it before then, but I was real, when I could really understand, I was probably around eight or nine years old. Um, I was super interested in scary things and horror movies, and we went to Blockbuster every weekend and rented out a scary movie, and um, so it just became an interest of mine. And once I got old enough to really 
seek out the ghost and, and know what, what that meant and what it was. Um, we would go to my grandmother's house every weekend, almost, me and maybe one or two of my friends. And my mom would just kind of, you know, summon her. We would, we would have a little seance. Um, in front of the mirror where she where she lived, and um, and yeah, it was it kind of went from there. So during the seances, we would make sure that it was pitch black dark. Um, it had to be, you know, the the sun had to be completely gone before we could we could start. Um, we would walk up into the older part of the house, which um, was no longer lived in by my grandparents. They lived in the newer part of the house in, in the front, or in the, actually that's the back. The front was the older part. Um, so it'd be pitch black dark, um, no heat, heating or air um, on at all. So whatever the temperature was at the time, um, if it was cold, it was cold back there. If it was hot, it was hot back there. Um, so we would go up with one single candle, usually in like a little, you know, a little holder. And we would set it in front of the mirror and we would all kind of make like a little half circle around however many there were. Usually there were at least three of us because I needed somebody else with me. <laughs> um, and my mom would just kind of start talking and she would just say, you know, Annie Laurie, if you're here, um, please give us a sign that you're here. You know, my daughter's with us and one of her friends and she really wants to meet you and I would love to introduce you to her. And most of the time we would just start feeling really cold, um, which happened pretty much every time we, you know, we, we said something to her. Um, you would get chill bumps, you, you know, your hair would stand up, you know, you would just feel like something. And then a lot of times you feel like something was just kind of watching you, uh, whether it was behind you or in front of you or around you or whatever it was, somebody was in there with you. Um, and then a few times the candle just would completely go out, like it would start flickering and, um, and eventually the flame would just disappear and we would be left in the dark. So we know from your mother when she did part one that Annie Laurie was such a huge part of your family. I mean, she literally is one of your ancestors. She's what your great, great aunt. Mm -hmm. um, and so when your parents, it's almost like, in my opinion, it sounds like your mom and your grandparents and perhaps your uncles almost had to prepare maybe you and your cousins and your brother and your sister for what the inevitable that you were going to eventually meet Annie Laurie because she was just such a presence in your grandmother's house. So when your mom and your grandmother were preparing you as a child to get used to this phenomenon, what were some of the things that they either told you or that you witnessed as a small child that were convincing to you that there was actually a ghost in your grandmother's house? Um, I think one of the one of the big things my mom would tell me stories, you know, all the time, either before we went and tried to summon her, or just you know driving down the road, just we talk about it. It's so interesting. Um, so I think one of the biggest things was um, the parlor doors that separated the dining room from the living room. Um, huge pocket parlor doors, you know, ceiling to floor. I mean, huge doors, and. Um, one day, it was like a Saturday night, my mom and her brothers were playing with those doors and they got pushed, you know, a good probably foot back into the wall. And, and I mean, you know, the opening was, was as big as the door, so you can't stick anything in there or anything. Um, so my grandfather, my mom said, was just super upset. He would have to call somebody to come get the doors, you know, either knock down the wall or something, use some type of tool to get the doors back out. And so, of course, they went to bed just all kind of upset that that had happened, and they woke up the next morning and tried to cut through um, to get to the kitchen, and the doors were actually closed and locked. And that was obvious. No human had done that. Right. As you said, they would have had to take down the wall to get the doors the Correct. Door I mean, the, the, the doors were probably, you know, that far back into the wall. And right. so even to try to reach your hand in there and pull it, there was not enough space for any human being to, to get that, you know, to get those, those doors back Those are very popular out. old Southern dividers. Those right. Doors. Yes. Yes. And yes. they were heavy and they were, you know, you know, like I said, as, as big as the whole wall itself. So to be, um, to be closed and locked in the morning, that was, that was a true testament to, um, and to the force. Strength. Yes. Mm -hmm. What did your grandfather say? What was his reaction to um, that? Well, I mean, of course I obviously wasn't there, but my mom just said he was, he was just kind of just like, okay, well, um, Whoever did that, you know, <laughs> um, just a little bit dumbfounded, you know, um, but obviously thankful that he didn't have to call anybody and she um, saved him some money. Right. Right. Yeah. She helped him out. It so. was her house too. Yes. <laughs> um, and then my grandmother just, just, we, we would go over there every day after school. Um, and I stayed with her lots and lots of times, um, just, you know, on the weekends or just for hours at a time. And we would be sitting there and something would happen. Like, um, there was, she had an old radio in the kitchen and it would just cut on and start playing some, some music. And, um, she'd say, Oh, you know, that was Annie Laurie. She just wanted us to 
here's some music, you know, and she'd walk in there and cut it off, or we'd be watching, like, I, I love to watch um, different shows when I got to her house, and the TV would just cut off randomly, and um, she'd, she'd say, oh my gosh, I was Annie Laurie, I gotta turn it back on now, and she'd flip it back on, um, and we'd hear, like, we'd hear things um, in, the, in the older part of the house, just like, you know, thuds or, or every now and then, and she'd just kind of look and not really, you know, say anything. I mean, wasn't really concerned about it, but, um, but yeah, just, just little things like that, that kind of, kind of solidified in my mind that there was something, something there. Okay. So I've, I've pulled your mama Beth back in for this because <laughs> this next story, I remember like it was yesterday and we're always as human beings, especially those of us who have experienced hauntings or paranormal phenomenon, we're always looking for proof. We want to be able to prove to ourselves that we're not crazy and prove to other people that what we're experiencing isn't just coming from our own minds. And so you told a story when we were very, very young, by the way, Keely and I are the same age. So we are the same generation down from our mothers. Um, about a letter that you had left Annie Laurie and yes. it's quite a funny story and a miraculous story at that so I'll let you guys continue okay um, so I like you said I wanted validation I wanted um, you know proof because that was you know just this the cool thing and I I had my own stories but then we tell people they're like oh, Sure, they just kind of smile and you know, yeah. um, but of course at the same time I was I was pretty scared. Um, I'm not gonna lie that it was it was a little terrifying. I really would not go up in that part of the room. I mean, part of the house by myself. I always need to have my mom or my grandmother or somebody with me. Um, but I did get this idea when I was around 11. I'm pretty sure I was 11 years old, around sixth grade. I decided to write her a letter because. You know, people respond to letters. And I mean, you didn't tell anybody that you were writing this letter, did you? I'm pretty sure I told my mom that I was writing it. Um, but I will never forget, I went in Yadi's kitchen, and you know, Yadi is my grandmother. I went in her kitchen, and I pulled out some of her blank. She had a little drawer where she kept her notepads, and I wrote out um, just a little letter, like asking kind of for her friendship, asking for Annie Laurie's friendship. And basically asking her like not to scare me at any point because <laughs> I mean I could barely like go to the restroom in my grandmother's house without like being scared of what was on the other side of the door. So um, this is kind of like my little plea like okay please be my friend and not you know don't scare me. me don't jump out and scare me at any point. <laughs> so um, I just wrote a little letter that said you know dear Annie Laurie I want to become your friend. Um, well I can show it but I was going to read it. Um, you seem very nice, and I underlined very, um, you know, to try to emphasize. You seem very nice the way my mom describes you. I am Keely, so I introduced myself. Elizabeth's daughter, and I put the one that you showed yourself to. Um, if you want to be my friend, then sign this or wreck something in the house. So to me, this was my way of saying, like, okay, this is my, like, peace offering. Um, you know, I want to be your friend. If you want to be my friend, then, then do do either one of these things. I said, or, because I really did not think that a know, ghost could sign a letter. That a ghost could sign a letter, but, you know, wishful thinking. And you did tape a pin to the I side did. Of um, so you can see the old tape. The old tape is right here. So I taped this to the mirror um, because there's a full length mirror, as my mom mentioned. And I put the pin, I'm pretty sure it was probably about right here where this little mm. rip is. The pin with a little, you know, um, top on it that could kind of sit there, and I left it there, and um, and probably, well, I want to say maybe the next day or a couple days later, my grandfather was admitted to the hospital um, just for a little. I think he might have had like a small stroke or um, I'm not sure. Nothing, I, too, nothing serious. too serious. He was um, there a couple of days. But he was there a couple of days, and so my, I remember my grandmother going and staying with him. I think she stayed with him. Most of the day, if not, you know. Um, so anyway, she came back one of the one of the days that she had she had been away, and she like she always checks the house when she gets home, and she went into the older part of the house, and when you enter into the older part, you come into the dining room from the kitchen, from the breakfast room, you come into the dining room, and she had you know big big window sills with potted plants all over um, that she would have to water and check on. So she watched she watched the dining room. And one of her potted plants was over on its side on the carpet, on the rug. So she had a rug underneath her dining room table. And there was probably a good three feet, a good three feet, if not more, between the windowsill and the rug. Well, the potted plant was on the rug, turned over on its side, but none of the dirt had spilled out at all. It was just like it was set there. And even, mm -hmm. even being set there, it was a real plant 
I mean, the dirt was not spilled. Like very it, considerate. Like how yeah, would you yeah. because that was a very old, beautiful car. Almost like yeah. defying, you know, so I, don't, I don't know. She wouldn't want to get that dirty. So she saw that, and then she kept, continued walking into the living room where the big mantle, fireplace, um, and one of her Tiffany, antique Tiffany vases was shattered into a gazillion pieces on the floor. And so that, of course, made her upset. <laughs> And then there was a picture of my mom, just a little framed, like five by seven picture of my mom on one of the little tables. And it was turned over on the rug face down, which again, the rug was a good two or three feet away from the hardwood or the floor. Um, so it was turned face down and she um, immediately just thought, you know, some type of little animal or something had gotten in. And she, I mean, she was furious that one of her vases were broken. So she called um, like a pest control company and she said, I need y'all to come out. Apparently there's something squirrel or yes, something missing. Something is getting in, a, you know, a, um, a you know, raccoon or something. And do you want to, I mean, she... Well, and they, she so pest control came out there, uh, a, a very nice man, and he looked around and said, well, Miss Hoyt, all the windows have... Um, motion detectors and sensors on them. If anything had gotten in through the window, uh, uh, the alarm would have gone off. And he said, and no motion detectors went off. And he said, clearly there's no animal in here. And so he said, I don't really know what to tell you. You know, what, what happened? And so my mother just, she couldn't figure it out. Well, on her little daily walks through the house, probably the next day, she goes into my bedroom where the mirror is and where she discovered the letter hanging on the mirror and she read the letter and got to the part where Keely asked Annie Laurie to break something in the house and she of course was furious and she called me picked up that phone called me she said I'm gonna get that Keely she got Annie Laurie to come and break something she broke my Tiffany lamp I mean vase should you get her over here right now so I had to go pick her up from a friend's house and we had to go over there and we had to make amends. And, yep. and but of course, the first thing I saw was the signature at the bottom of the page. And that That's was pretty incredible. That was the just the and most. And the pen was laying on the floor. The pen it? was inside the closet. Yeah, inside the closet. And the closet door was closed. I mean, nobody had opened the closet door. So the pen was inside the closet, um, you know, not attached to the letter anymore. And obviously the signature. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was. It was my claim to fame. And of course, the older I got, you know, I would ask, I actually asked Yadi a couple of times, you know, what, what happened? Like, did you, did you sign that letter? Like, you know, did you just tell me, like, I'm not going to be upset. Just tell me, ask mom a few times. And I mean, both of them were like, absolutely not. I mean, and plus why would, you know, Yadi's whole thing was, why would I break my vase? Like, why would I? <laughs> so it's almost like, you know, if, if we didn't believe this, you know, Annie Laura was like, okay, let me do, let me do both of these things so that we can um, establish, you know, that I'm here. And, and I'll be your friend. And I will be yeah. your friend. Yes. I'm not going to, not going to jump out and scare you. <laughs> <No>. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is definitely my, um, yeah, my claim to, uh, to say that, that there was a presence and, and that she, she was real. She's, yeah. So was the punishment worth the crying? Yes. I just kind of got a little, a little talking to and. Yeah. And please don't leave any more letters. Please like don't that. leave any more letters. Don't ever do that again kind of thing. So, yes, it was definitely worth it. Definitely <laughs> worth it. Yes. So, one of the, um, probably the last experiences that I had while I lived in Rome um, was my, my senior year of high school. We had to do a project, and I'm pretty sure it was my literature class. It was something to do with... Um, so we had like a choice board where we could do like a documentary, we could do a video, we could do a story, we could do like several different things. And as soon as I saw this, the documentary, or not the documentary, but the video portion of it, it was around the same time that the Blair Witch Project had come out, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, and so I instantly thought of that in my grandmother's house and kind of connected the two. And I had a little group with me. Um, I think it was a couple of boys and maybe another girl, so four, four of us. And I just said, hey, let's, let's create a little script and let's pretend like, you know, we're kind of recreate the Blair Witch Project in my grandmother's house because it's haunted and, and we can have, you know, just have some fun going in there at night and filming. And so one of the boys brought his video camera one night. We set it up for one of the weekend, you know, one of the weekend nights. And we had a little script and everything that we were going to, you know, kind of follow. And he was going to kind of follow us around the house and we were going to act out these different things. And just as soon as we started, I mean, we did not even need the script because it just, 
instantly like took off. We um we set up I think first like in the hallway. So we were we were at the end of the hallway facing the the door, which my mom's room was right off. You could see the door of her room, um, right there, you know, in the camera. And we just kind of talked for a minute, like I, well, he was setting it up and getting it all going. And when we cut off the film and watched it back, um, we saw all these little different orbs and all this, this lighting that we could not see in real life. So on the video, it caught all of it. And it was all around the front door and kind of coming you know, out of my mom's bedroom and just all right there, you know, super cool. So of course we were like, oh my God, we gotta keep that. And I forget exactly what we were saying in the background, you know, while it was, it was filming, but I feel like I was probably saying something about the house and something about how it's haunted and things like that. Um, and then we moved the camera into the bedroom, into my mom's bedroom and set it up on a tripod. And me and the, the three other, uh, two other people were sitting in front of the mirror and then the one boy was behind the camera because it was his, his camera. And of course it was dark and um, we had, I think we had a candle because that's, that was kind of the norm, you know, just a little candle to see by. And he instantly, as soon as he turned it on, he was like, well, wait a second. He's like, this keeps, this keeps messing up. This keeps zooming it in and out, in and out. And he's like, well, I can't, I can't make it stop. And he, we could like hear him in the background. We were like, well, come on now. We're ready to get started. Like make it stop. You know? And he was like, I can't. It's like, it just, it just has like a mind of its own. Like it just keeps doing whatever it wants to do. Like talking about the camera. And, um, and then like he finally, it kind of, finally kind of calmed down and we kind of said a few things. And then he said, well, well. Now I'm going to have, he's like, it, it went from like a hundred percent battery to now it's like 5%. And he's like, it, like it just happened, you know, like that. And he was like, I'm going to have to charge it. He's like, I, it's going to die. And so we were just like, okay, well, you know, this is <laughs> so, so the, the mix of the, you know, the orbs that we couldn't see in real life and, and the camera just dying just instantly. I mean, he had, he had just charged it. It was ready to go. Um, you know, all of that, all of that combined just made for a really cool project. And when we ended up turning it in, um, the teacher was just, was like oh my gosh you know like most people you know and um and I remember mom asked you know can can you get that and, and keep it and, and they would not the boy you know he wanted it he's like I, I want this it's like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen and he's like I want to keep this so with it being his you know his camera and his his thing I was like all right well, you, you can keep it so so I asked your mother this question when we we both grew up here in in Rome Georgia both were Presbyterians deep south evangelical this is the Bible Belt, but also ghost stories are common. They're a big part of Southern culture, as well as the Low Country in New Orleans having a voodoo and hoodoo. So we we are experienced in other forms of faith. Right. However, being of the Christian foundation, how has the story of Annie Laurie affected your spiritual life? Um, I do believe that there is a middle ground for some people. Um, I do, I, you know, I have heard of the um, unfinished business, you know, kind of stance. And if I had to kind of go from there, I think that that could, there could be some truth to that. Um, you know, Annie Laurie was super young. She was only 18. She hadn't experienced, you know, what normal young women would probably want to experience. She um, was a painter. So she had started a big mural um, in, in one part of the house and apparently had never finished it. And it had been painted over and, you know, um, so I'm wondering, it just makes me wonder if, you know, she really just felt like she wasn't ready to leave at that time. And to me, that doesn't affect my faith because I still believe in God. I still believe in heaven and hell and, you know, the whole Christian belief. Um, but I do believe that there are some spiritual beings with us for one reason or another. And if it's, you know, in her case, if it was just that unfinished business that she you know, maybe never got to finish the mural or never got to, you know, experience Slim becoming life. a mother and living life and, you know, being married and things like that. Um, so she, in death, it's almost like, I've said this with your mom, it's almost like we have free will of choice even in death. Possibly, possibly. I don't know if I would say, if I would say that she had free will. I don't know if any spirit has the freedom to say, you know, I want to remain. Um, I don't know if it's something that, that um, just sort of happens because of mm -hmm. the situation surrounding their death or their you know like you said how kind of the energy that they that they have um I, I can't explain that part but i do feel like that we are definitely surrounded by things that are not necessarily human beings you know in flesh and blood um, spirit all the time correct yes
So Keely, a lot of people have these experiences growing up in older homes or not necessarily even older homes where they've had things happen that they can't quite wrap their head around. And a lot of people keep those stories very private because they don't want to be labeled as crazy or they don't want to be looked at in a bad way. Now for us here in the South, we're used to these haunted houses. This is very normal and I've always admired your family for being so open about Annie Laurie. Um, but if there's anybody out there watching this video that feels the need to connect with you or ask you questions or maybe share their own experience, is there a way that they can get in contact with you? Yes, the best way to contact me would be through my email. Um, it's Keely, K-E-E-L-Y, 1624 at gmail.com. And I will put that down in the description bo box below, as well as I will put a link to Keely's business too so you can check her out there and we will be seeing Keely again because we have another part to this story that we're gonna film we're not done with these stories there's even more Annie Laurie to come so thank you so much Keely for thank being you. here thank you so much